It's time for the WCW Monday Nitro main event of the evening. This is where the big boys play, huh? Look at the adjective. Play. We ain't here to play. But it's Donald Trump hangs on to the top of the Trump Plaza with his family under his other arm as they sink to the bottom of the sea. Thank God Donald Trump, the Hulkamaniac. here to take a good long look at this crap I'm in. Oh, my new name is Seven, by the way, so they've dressed me up like Uncle Fester. And I don't mind telling you, I was wearing these $600 custom-made lizard shoes and this $13,000 Rolex. First off, David, it's, it's uh, tremendous to, to bring you on. Um, you've been a, a part of uh, wrestling, a part of both Noah and I's sort of upbringing into the wrestling business as we uh, became fans of WCW's man. So just kind of tell us how things have been going. It's been a crazy time. Um, the wrestling business has found a way to forge on, but just kind of tell us what you've been up to during uh, some of these some of these crazier times here. Uh, not working because I'm a realtor and nobody wants to buy a house right now or go see a tour of one. Um, but uh but yeah, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. I bet somebody uh probably now about seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago, a guy named Lenny Leonard, who's uh does play by play and ring announcing for uh Evolve. And uh I bet him a couple of drinks that they would never cancel WrestleMania in Tampa. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I look back at I look back at that thought right now and boy, you know, it's amazing in six or seven weeks how much the world has changed. But, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I, every, it seems like every few, uh, every hour I change my opinion on whether we overreacted, whether it, it, it weren't, the numbers weren't the same uh, as predicted because we did what we were supposed to do and they asked us to do. But, you know, my parents are in that age group, so I understand. I mean, I, you know, and, and, and you know, there's a lot of people out there that have pre-existing conditions. So I think at some point we got to open the world back up slowly uh, probably sooner than later, but I get it. I understand. And it, you know, it's a, it's a once in a lifetime happening. I just wish on, on all the side, and I don't talk politics really, but I just wish on all the sides, uh, people would stop pointing fingers. There's plenty of times to figure it time to figure out who, who was right and who was wrong. Once this thing is over for right now, everybody should just work together, uh, no matter what, who you like in politics or what, uh, what, uh, party you're aligned with and just work to fix this thing yeah we're definitely hoping for that and that, uh, that's you... that's my that's my preaching for the night sorry <laughs> as far as far as um as far as how this re relates to the wrestling business which i'm assuming is what you asked um you know i thought i wouldn't enjoy wrestlemania in the in the in you know close arena in the empty arena and i really did I really did enjoy it um, a lot more than I thought I would, but I just am having a real problem watching um, watching Raw and SmackDown uh, with, without fans. Uh, it's it's just getting harder and harder, and I don't know if it's just me. I commend them. I commend AEW. Yeah, I I still I didn't get to watch last week with um, where Jericho. I guess. Uh, did the color for the entire show, which I heard is fa I heard is fantastic. So it's on my DVR, and I'm going to get to it one of these days soon. But um, hopefully this weekend. But um, you know, I, I'll watch them live, but uh, and I'll watch NXT. But for some, and I liked WrestleMania, like I said, for some reason, Raw and SmackDown just aren't talking to me right now in that environment. But um, but you know, hey, they're 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 plowing away and. You know, everybody, like I said, you know, you could say they're right for doing it. You could say they're wrong for doing it. I, you know, I, let's all let's all point fingers after this thing is over because everybody's just trying to do their best, I think. Hey, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the WWE has been deemed essential in the state of Florida, and it's I, I applaud it. You've got at least some kind of programming, some entertainment. You know, you have WrestleMania over two nights. Did, did you like did you like the Boneyard Undertaker AJ match? Did you did you like that? Love that, and I love the uh, Firefly House of Fun match even more. I thought that was fantastic. 
Uh, it's not something you could, neither is something you could do every week. Although the cinematic stuff, you could like uh, the Boneyard match, you could do more often. The acid trip kind of shoot, you know, work, you know, uh, blurring the lines, like the Firefly House of Fun match. You can't do that all the time, but every once in a while, when the time is right, a couple times a year, maybe you could do stuff like that. I thought I really enjoyed it. It was some humor in there. There was a lot of shooting there. And, um, and and a lot of honesty and emotion in there, and I, I really really enjoyed that. And I, I I would if you'd have explained it to me, because I was behind my son. He was watching upstairs. He's a big fan, and I was behind on the second day. And he came down. And he was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" And he started sort of explaining without giving away the whole thing. And I, it sounded to me like it was silly. But then when when I watched it, I was like, "Oh my god, he's right. This is amazing." So, p- kudos to the to the, to Cena and Bray. Uh, kudos to. Um, to the writers, whoever put that together and wrote it, uh, it was it was. I really enjoyed that. I I liked the Boneyard match. I thought the ladder match was fantastic. I'll be honest with you, and I hate to say this because I was a big fan of the storyline going in. It was one of my favorite things leading up to WrestleMania that WWE was doing, um, especially on the Raw Smack or SmackDown shows, which I like. I said I don't have as much interest in for whatever reason. Um, is the the Edge and Randy Orton match, man. And I hate to say this because I give them both so much credit. I love the angle that they did with Orton, you know, not knowing whether to to put him out of wrestling for his own good or 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 be his friend and give him a hug. I just thought it was it was fascinating. Um, you know, they they killed themselves out there probably more than they probably even should have. But um it just went too long. Just if it was twenty if it was 15 minutes less i think it would have it would have done what it was supposed to do but that's just my opinion <coughs> yeah no ab- absolutely and it's uh, good that we have that to talk about and that's that's you know a testament to the wwe and and what they were able to do but david i kind of want to take you back because uh just a couple weeks ago here on this show we had uh, gary michael capetta on and uh of course um he preceded you in wcw as the uh, lead ring announcer uh, I just kind of want to take you back to the, the start of, of your career in WCW because I know that you were like acting as a booking agent for uh, for like for, for Florida wrestlers that were getting uh, looks in WCW. Just kind of take us through the process of how you wound up kind of getting hired and, and wound up kind of taking over for Gary and what kind of a mentor he was to you. So Gary, I, I love Gary Capetta, first of all. Um, so yeah, I was, what I didn't know at the time is that um, there's a guy named Jody Hamilton, the masked assassin, who he was in charge of a lot of things, but one of the things he was in charge of was booking the what they called at the time job guys, which is now politically correctly more known as enhancement talent. And uh, the job guys back then didn't care, but uh, somebody did and changed it. So whatever floats your boat. Um, so what what would happen is there's like Italian Stallion and George South in the Carolinas, Rip Rogers out of Louisville, Bobby Starr out of Baltimore, Scott Demore out of Detroit. And um, for a time, although not when I was there, a guy named Mike Jackson, who believe it or not, still wrestles at 71 years old out of, um, out of uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And so they would, they would, instead of Jody having to book 30 separate guys, he'd book five guys or six guys that would book five guys or six guys. And, you know, that was made his job easier. Uh, WCW paid for the rental car and the gas the rental van and the gas and they, and the deal was, and everybody was knew the deal. All the wrestlers knew the deal because they were getting their trans paid for is that you'd give the, whoever the booker was $25 out of your, your money. And it worked really good uh, for, you know, the other guys cause they were also enhancement talent job guys. So they're getting their job, their money. Plus they're getting $25 a person for whoever bring up. So it's extra money for me. They, they weren't going to pay me anything because I wasn't going in the ring and doing uh, enhancement work. So I just went up and did it uh, for the $25 from each guy. And I just saw, you know, I figured that was my foot in the door. And I just, I, I went running from there. I dove into anything and everything I can as like a stooge, uh, you know, mm. and I'm not afraid to say that, you know, uh, you know, when I say stooge running guys for, for promos uh, had a sign-in sheet that um, that people had to sign in to get paid. Uh, new talent, uh, new enhancement talent had to fill out a certain form to get paid. Uh, making sure that guys were in the uh, gorilla position um, for their next match. 
Uh, Junkyard Dog actually, bless his soul, actually named me Walking Man because all <laughs> I did is walk the whole or walk around the whole entire time. But uh, but yeah, so that led to an opportunity to get the backup ring announcer job, which I probably won by default, if I'm honest. But I'll take it. And um, and then to get to the heart of your question, when uh, Gary told me about a year before he was leaving. And I was like, no, you're not. You're not leaving. They'll offer you a big bunch of big money at the right before or, or you know, it's just contract negotiations. And th- they did, I guess you probably heard it from Gary yourself. They did offer him money at the towards the end that he yeah. turned down. But um, but I guess about two, like six weeks out, two months out, mm-hmm. I started. I was like, I don't think he's I, I don't think he's coming back. I don't think he's kidding. And so at that point, I knew that I needed to know what the heck I was doing for the, these big shows. Now, this was before anybody knew about Nitro, so we had no idea. But Saturday night was considered the flagship show, and I had never done Saturday night. So, um, so you know, he just kept giving me tips. And, you know, in WCW, especially for me, the main job of the ring announcer was not so much to introduce the matches. As a matter of fact, you barely heard me, and there was a reason for that. Uh, but... Um, my job was to entertain the audience, keep them excited, keep them clapping, keep them informed of what was going on. Uh, that 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 and that was a lot of Gary's job too. And nobody did it better than Gary Capetta. Uh, he came up with some ingenious stuff, some of which I I didn't steal, but I I took parts of it and I made it my own um, with his permission. But um, uh, you know, he just was a huge help, and he's been a great friend and. Um, you know, hey, and part of me has to appreciate the fact that he decided to walk away because Nitro came along and uh, reluctantly, I think they put me in that lead spot with their fingers crossed. And uh, I guess I did well enough not to lose it. And uh, the Monday Night Wars happened and and the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, that's great. But what was your relationship like with Michael Buffer and what did you think of him coming in to announce the big main events for the company? You know, and I don't think, I don't know if you asked Gary. Did you ask Gary about that? Yeah. And G- did Gary say he wasn't crazy about it? No, he liked, he said it was great. He said it, he thought it enhanced, uh, made the event seem bigger. So I, it kind of surprised me. I didn't think he would have been a fan. Oh, no, I didn't. I wasn't sure either. Um, you know, I, I'm a capitalist. Uh, I, I believe that, you know, uh, and you, you come into this world with an opportunity to invent something or, 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 you know, rise to levels or come up with a catchphrase. And Michael Buffer came up with a hell of a catchphrase and a hell of a voice. Let's get ready to rumble. And people tried to, um, you know, Jimmy Lennon does It's Time. And I think his his brother Bruce has one too. But there's nothing like Let's Get Ready to Rumble. It's the, the original and it's the best. And it gets people hyped up. And no, I mean, I understood 100%. He came up with it. He cashed in on it. It was worth it. And he was great to me. Um, he was nice as could be. I thought it was great. It didn't bother me at all. Um, about five years ago, he was doing a boxing show that my brother was at down at a casino in uh, South Florida. And my brother walked up to him and said after like in the bar or something or maybe uh, before the show and said, hey, I don't know if, my, if you remember my brother's name is David Penzer. He was a ring announcer for WCW. He was like, yeah, absolutely. I know him. And he said, let me tell you something, and please tell your brother this. He said, I got lucky. Your brother had talent. And that really meant a lot to me because it's sort of true. <laughs> not, to, not to sound like I'm full of myself, but he got lucky. He came up with a catchphrase. And he, not that he wasn't good at the rest of it, but, um, you know, he was making, I think, probably 10 grand a show, you know, for, for that catchphrase, which is more than I was making in back when I first started, at least, in in four or five in a, in a quarter. So, uh, so, you know, um, tip of the hat to him, man. And I appreciate the sentiments. Well, uh, Chris Jericho always kind of cites you as a, as a big reason while, uh, his heel character kind of started to get over there. You guys wound up having, having physical run-ins. He would assault you when you would announce the winner's name. Um, Chris really kind of talk, take us through that because, uh, Chris almost had to go into business for himself to get himself over. He was lost in the shuffle, uh, and you were a big part of that. Just kind of talk about how Chris kind of approached you with this and uh, and how much fun it was to to be involved physically and really help this character get over. And Chris winds up becoming, you know, one of the bigger stars in the business. Uh, and, and 20 years later, here he still is one of them. So it was it was a great time for sure. 
Yeah, me and Chris and I really clicked as soon as he came in. For whatever reason, our sen sense of humor is pretty much exactly the same. As a matter of fact, half the time that he's doing stuff, and I know he's not doing it for me, but I, I feel like he's just doing it to pop me. That's how much our senses of humor are the same. And um, and are we like the same kind of music, and so uh, we're about the same age. So... And and the the one thing that bonded us is I was the producer for the market specific interviews that Gene Okerlund used to tape in the we set up a gray box with a camera and it was air conditioned in the parking lot next to the television truck and we taped those market specific interviews that were uh, you know you talk to each city on the syndicated shows and then you Gene would bring in a guest and Chris would be there from the time we started till the time we ended unless he had an interview he had to do for the show um, for months at a time. And anytime we needed somebody in a pinch and couldn't get somebody, Chris would volunteer to go in and, uh, and, and learn and, and do the interviews, even though he knew he was green as hell because he wanted to learn and, and you, learning from Gene Oakland, there can't be anybody better in the world to learn and to carry you through something like that. So, you know, that's how that, that we sort of, um, bonded through those things we started driving together a little bit with some of the other guys um and he, we just started talking about stuff and you know i i would say about 75 percent of that angle was his idea about 15 20 percent was terry taylor's input and maybe five percent was you know my idea just uh you know pretty much just saying hey yeah i'd love to do it and and you know maybe i might given an idea or two but he's the, one of the most to this day one of the most creative people in this business, if not the most creative person in the history of the business. And the, uh, I would have never thought in a million years that he'd still be recreating himself all these years later on a on a semi-annual basis. It's just absolutely amazing. We've recently gotten back um, uh, and, and hung out a little bit. Um, I saw it sold his house that... Uh, that he, he had bought a new house, so I sold his old house. I'm sure you guys have seen the new house if you watch AEW, uh, or at least the backyard. But um, <laughs> uh, release the hounds. But uh, <laughs> that, that was too much. But uh, I love the thing he said at the end. That's why that's that's the kind of stuff where I feel like uh, like I feel like he's like doing that for me when he said the the the, the thing was flying away and he said, "Wait, you took my damn T-shirt." And that's just like my sense of humor and his sense of humor. And, and even my wife even popped for it. She was watching along. So, um, so it was great. It was fun. Uh, to, that was the first real chance I had to participate in any kind of angle. Uh, so it was a blast. It's a great memory. It's even better that uh, I was able to do it with one of, if not the all-time best, and uh, a good friend. So I can't say enough about it. It was an honor to be a part of it. Yeah, we love Chris. We're so excited for all the success he continues to have. And like you said, reinventing, recreating himself in AEW now and, and will continue to. But David, uh, you come into WCW and they're kind of trying to find themselves. Then with the formation of the NWO, trash just strewn across the ring. That leads to 83 straight weeks of you guys dominating the ratings war against WWE. So kind of take us through coming into the company, not only you guys finding your footing, but crushing the competition by bringing in the likes of Hogan, Savage, Luger, Hall and Nash, and then developing the biggest storyline of wrestling history, the NWO. Yeah, well, pretty much as you probably know, uh, the the Nitro thing was sort of like I'm done on a dare. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, T Turner was he was in a meeting with Turner and Turner said, what what do you need to uh, compete with Vince? And Eric, thinking he would never get it, said live head-to-head -head on Monday nights. And Turner said done. And then Eric had to figure out what the hell to do next. <laughs> so I don't know that any of us were expecting anything out of that. You know, it was exciting. I guess the Mall of America was a cool little spot to do it. And it was a different kind of vibe. Um, I sort of figured that we were on to something when Lex Luger came out. And that's when it clicked in my head that, you know, they, they, they're, they're playing to win. And this isn't just, you know, we're doing this because Turner kind of did it on a dare uh you know that we're playing to win, that we're playing to win and um you know as when scott hall w walked down those stairs in macon georgia i knew he was coming but i didn't know what he was going to say uh and and when he did his promo acting like he was coming from there talking about scheme gene and and billionaire ted and you want to fight you got to fight uh <laughs> that a even bigger light bulb went off in my head and i was like holy crap this is good so, 
you know, when Hogan turned and he was the third guy, uh, which is, as far as I know, came down to the wire, uh, they, uh, you know, like you said, the garbage just started flowing. The crowd started getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we started doing more and more shows. We added Thunder. It was crazy. It was, you know, I look back and I don't know how I did it. It was 25 days a month. Uh, it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, house shows, Monday, Night Show, Tuesday, Thunder, every other Wednesday, Saturday night. So every other week you would fly home on Thursday and then have have one day home, not even a whole day because you had to fly out on Friday for the house show. So it was it was crazy. And um but it was fun. I was living my dream. You know, people started kind of knowing who I was a little bit and, you know, wanting, you know, hey, an autograph here or a picture here. And, you know, it, it's 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 an honor to, to for stuff like that. You know, like I said, this, this was my dream. And I really never thought that I'd have made it to the heights that I made it. So the fact that I was able to do that was was awesome. The fact that I was able to to hang out, ride and, and party with some of, you know, some of my favorite people wrestlers of all time you know have sitting there having drinks with bobby heenan i mean i used to in college me and my uh me and my friend a friend of mine in college used to uh we used to get stoned and uh watch the tuesday night titans thing with bobby heenan just cracking <laughs> us up he's Man, we yes just, just crack. And, and and i i'm not a smoker i haven't smoked since college but that's what we did and the fact that you know, I used to say to myself, I had this list, and I still have it to this day, actually, but I've always had this list. If I could have a drink with three three people who are alive, who would I like to have a cocktail with? And um, Bobby Heenan was always on the top of that list. And everybody has a kind of list like that, a bucket list or, you know, a freebie, you know, if you're married, you know, who'd your freebie be? Um, <laughs> nobody ever thinks that they're going to have a chance to, 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 you know, actually do that. And not only that, he took me under his wing and, 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 you know, there was a night, there was an announcer's trailer. So think about this for a time period when there was an announcer's trailer outside this about an hour and a half before nitro, while we were all getting dressed, this is who I got to listen, tell stories back and forth. Tony Schiavone, Mean Gene Okerlund, Larry Zabisco, Bobby the Brain Heenan, Lee Marshall, Mike Tenay. Yeah, I mean that that it gives that's, me goosebumps saying it after all this time. I mean, you know, it, it's a it's a it's it's a dream of anybody who's a wrestling fan. You know, I don't care who you are. I mean, that's a, that you know, people if you could bid on that that people would bid thousands, ten thousands of dollars if they had the money to to live that opportunity. And I got paid for doing it every Monday. Um, so yeah, it's just it's so cool, you know, Terry Funk and getting to know him and and Dusty and. And Arn Anderson and Ric Flair, who I was very close with, I drove with Arn for most of my tenure there, and I drove with uh, with Flair and Arn for about a year when Flair went back on the road. And um, hell, even most people don't know this. I actually met Stephanie McMahon recently at a WrestleMania luncheon, kickoff luncheon, and I I had the opportunity to introduce myself, and she had, she ended up knowing my name, but. Uh, Trip, uh, John Paul, a very young John Paul Levesque, when he first came into WCW as Terror Rising, used to travel with me, me and Pee Wee Anderson, the referee, for about the first six months of him breaking uh -huh. in. So, so you know, it's just uh, it's it's crazy. You look back and the stuff you got to experience, and and growing up a wrestling fan, and so desperately wanting to be in a business that I had no reason being in because I had no athletic ability and no connection really uh, at, at the time when you needed a connection. I just got. I worked hard and I got luck, a couple lucky breaks and it just all worked out. Thank God. Well, it, it was a great run. And uh, according to legend, you never missed a, a thunder or a nitro or your entire career in WCW. But in 2001, it comes to an end. Obviously the company had been on a downswing. You have an AOL time Warner merger, uh, creative kind of going in the tank. Eric Bischoff sent home. Things got bad. What was your kind of emotions heading into that? Last Nitro, Sting and Flair close it out just like they did. They started it in 95, September 95. Just kind of what was your emotions as, as uh, the end came for WCW? Well, I decided that if I was going to go out, I was going to go out working my ass off to entertain that crowd to the best of my ability. And be probably because if I didn't, I'd have tears coming down, down my eyes. So not, little, not you know, I'm not sobbing, but you know what I mean. Uh, it was it was emotional experience. Don't get me wrong. For a lot of guys, it was emotional for a lot of guys. You know, there were guys that were that had, had enough, like Shivani, who was like, you know, this is the happiest day of my life, and drove right home uh, seven, eight hours. 
Um, and he was, he was so burnt out. He was my immediate supervisor the whole time I was there and he was so burnt out. So I, I get that. And I'm so glad that he's found his way back in, in the business and has su such success. Um, that's really uh, a story for the ages that nobody could have predicted, but, uh, it has a happy ending, but, um, you know, I just went out there. I worked hard. I, 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 you know, did my all. I came to the back afterwards. Uh, and I and Shane McMahon happened to be at the gorilla position, and I wasn't going to say anything to Shane. I just uh, didn't want to look like a suck up. And he stopped me and he said, "Hey, you did a really great job out there. Thank you." And I thought that was really nice. He shook my hand, and I thought maybe he might bring, you know, bring back a recommendation. The thing is, is WWE had never had their ring announcers really talk during commercial breaks. They always played videos or or music. They never really their ring announcers were more online and and you know they would be more visible but less of a cheerleader for the crowd and in wcw is always a cheerleader for the crowd and other than probably gary uh who had a rep great reputation worldwide as as a one of the top ring announcers in the world you know really not a lot of of tv time but um but yeah that's what i did and then i went and got drunk with johnny grunge <laughs> of all people perfect <laughs> Well, David, uh, I'm not sure if you saw the recent uh, Vice Dark Side of the Ring about Chris Benoit. Uh, it's with your buddy Chris Jericho narrating and being in it. And I just kind of want to get your thoughts on that, if you've seen it, and the dealings you had with Chris in WCW. Well, it's funny. I haven't really... I finally watched part two yesterday. I, uh, part one was really tough for my wife and I both. Um, and I finally got... Part two wasn't that bad, so I should have just watched it. But I didn't know. We just really... Part one really hit us hard. Um, I was in a very unique position, and if I think about it now, and I'm not bragging, it's just a shoot, I was probably as far as both sides of that story, Chris, uh, Kevin and Nancy, and then Chris and Nancy, and Chris's family, the closest to both sides of anyone in the world, because other than Nancy, because on one hand, I was traveling a lot with Kevin Sullivan when he was, way before they started this angle, when he was... Um, when, when him and Nancy first started arguing and not getting along. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I, 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 I was, you know, uh, personally watching that happen. And then Chris and his wife lived in Peachtree City. And there was a little group of us in Peachtree City, Georgia. Um, Johnny Grunge and his wife, Fit Finley, his wife, William Regal and his wife. A guy named Darwin, who was a cameraman, uh, and his wife, Jill. And... Um, David Taylor and his wife, and we would all, and Benoit and his wife at the time, and then when Nancy moved there, but we would all go out either on the weekends or if we had off days, we'd go, you know, dinner. We knew each other's families. We socialized. It was like a little family in a family. And and so I, I, I saw both sides closer than probably anybody had seen both sides other than Nancy. And um, it, it didn't dawn on me until this whole thing came back into the, in, you know, streaming into the everybody's memory because of the the documentary so it was unique um uh you know it was it, it was it, it the whole thing's still tough i mean you know uh how do how, how do you explain that i saw things that that a lot of people that knew chris better than i didn't see um and once chris realized that our little group was seeing some cracks in the armor um he pulled him and nancy out of there as fast as he could to the point where None of us, when we heard what happened, were surprised that, you know, none of us, nobody that I spoke to out of that whole group thought, oh, my God, this is a, uh, this is a, you know, mur this is a, you know, somebody broke in their house and murdered the whole family. Everybody knew that it had, whatever happened went down in that house with the three people that weren't alive anymore. Um, and, and, and the proof of that is uh, William Regal's comments or lack thereof about uh, Chris the person in his interview that they, they featured on the, uh, the documentary. So the, the main thing that we were all surprised about is that they had moved. He pulled himself so far out of uh, that little group because, uh, you know, we started seeing things that he didn't like us seeing that they, we didn't, none of uh, the, the biggest surprise to us was that when the hell did they move? Yeah. And that, yeah, that was so, Hard, so for, hard to watch, yeah. Yeah, so for me, it's always been tough. For you know, for for everybody in that Peachtree City group, it's been tough because we saw a little bit of the cracks. Now, would I ever looked at my wife and said, you know, he's going to kill his family one day? No, 
but there was you could tell there was definitely something a little bit off about him and 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 their relationship and and so you know and then and then you know he 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 confided a lot in Johnny Grunge. They both confided a lot in Johnny Grunge. There's a part of me that thinks if Johnny Grunge was still alive, that they would that they would still be alive because uh, I think he confided in Eddie, and then Eddie passed. She confided probably in different people, maybe Vicky Guerrero, and then um, but then they both for some reason the only person they both were comfortable confiding in maybe because he was like a you know quote unquote screw up. You know, uh, and and I don't say that like his uh, he was a fantastic wrestler and a fantastic person and a great dad. But, you know, he had his issues and so was Johnny Grunge. And so they both felt comfortable going to him. The ironic part of that is he would call me and stooge it all off. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I knew what that's how I knew a lot of what I knew. But um, there's a part of me that thinks that if they had whatever happened that weekend, if they could have called Johnny and Johnny could have come over. I mean, I think they even showed in the documentary. If I'm correct me if I'm wrong, grunge in their par- driveway yeah, one time. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, do. so I, I really think that he could have diffused it, but you know, he he wasn't there, and and so it was a tragedy. And you know, it's really hard to it's really hard for a lot of people, including myself, to accept. You know, to try to come to terms with how how do you feel about a guy who was one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, uh, one of the nicest guys in the business at most polite guys in the business, but then started to crack and killed his wife and son. Uh, I, you know, it's, that's, if he was a jerk, it'd be a lot easier to, you know, for, it, it would be a lot of less of a, a, a thing for guys like Jericho and Chavo and Dean and, 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 and everybody else to say, oh, he was always a jerk. I you know, I, I didn't think he'd go this far, but since he was always so polite and nice and hid whatever was going on so well, you know, it really came as a shock. How do you, you know, people to this day, and you even see Chris and, and, and uh, Chavo in that special and Dean a little bit grasping for answers. Still, it's hard for them to figure out how to, how to, how to live with, with the reality of what happened. Yeah, because a lot of those guys said that's not the Chris that they knew and, and loved and their friend. And so to me, it's just like I know the media came out right after that talking about roid rage. And and I just think it's a complex issue. It's a horrendous tragedy. I mean, there's CTE, substance abuse, steroids. Uh, the passing of Eddie, I think, had a huge effect on him as well. So there's a lot of things going that probably changed the Chris that they talked about that they knew and loved and yeah. kind of morphed him into something else that – somehow that he could do this. I will say that uh, I never realized, I knew that, you know, through speaking to people, I knew that Chris, after it happened, speaking to people, I knew that Chris had really, was really upset when Eddie died. And obviously he would be, you know, I, I knew that cause I hung with those guys in WCW, but until I saw like the, the explanation by Jericho and the kind of replay of, 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 you know, of what he was going through by, you know, the, characterization that they did in the special i'd mm-hmm. never dawned on me just how hard it, it 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 affected chris and you know i really think that and grunge being uh dying uh you know i think that if, if those two things wouldn't happen i think we'd be inducting chris benoit in the hall of fame if he wasn't already inducted but unfortunately it happened and so it is what it is and it's just you know it's it's tough lately because it's all coming back to the forefront and yeah. it's something that you well, you never want to forget Daniel and Nancy. Um, you know, you also don't want to harp on on what was a horrible time. Yeah, and yeah, yeah there was TV people all over. And, you know, everybody's calling us in Peachtree City, all the little group and uh, Dateline NBC, and you know Nancy Grace, and I wasn't having any part of that. So, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah, I help. I think I think Chris Jericho would tell you I helped him a lot. Try to kind of understand because. He, 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 of all the people I spoke to, and once people started hearing that I wasn't surprised, uh, they started reaching out to me. Out of all the people, I think Jericho, uh, even back then, had was the one who took it, you know, the hardest as far as not being able to, in his head, understand how this person could have done such a horrible thing. And, and like I said earlier, I think that to this day, there's, there's, I think he's come to grips with it. But I think that there's still, you know, a few questions in his mind that he would love the answers to, but we're never going to get. 
Yeah. yeah, big part of it. Uh, David, I'll tell you what, we could go round and round with you about a lot of different topics, but we just can't thank you enough for jumping on and talking with us, uh, you know, providing some much needed distraction for us and our listeners. And anytime well, we, don't we can have do to, that, we don't great. have to end on, we don't have to end on Benoit. Do well, we? <laughs> that, 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 that wasn't by design or anything. I was like, well, I guess we could uh, discuss the entire card of uh, sold out 98 or something and get in on a better note. But yeah, it's, <laughs> I, you know, we just, uh, we, we uh, know you've done a lot since then. And, you know, the, the wrestling business moves on and we, uh, you, you've, you've moved on in a career. How, how can, how can people get a hold of you? If, if our listeners in Florida, how can they get a hold of you if they want to buy a home? Let's, let's go there. All right. You could go to david.penzer at gmail.com. Not expecting anybody to reach out to me now, but if you have any future plans to buy or sell a home in the Tampa, Lakeland, St. Pete, uh, uh, Clearwater area, um, and parts South and North of that, uh, reach out to me and um, we could start the process even if it's a year out. Um, if you are listening to this and um, and you're thinking about moving as soon as this thing is over and, and everybody's back to normal, knock on wood, that everybody w- that life will be back to normal. And I believe it will be. It's going to be a, a, a total buyer's market and the interest rates are going to be sick low. So if you're thinking about moving, you're not going to have a better time then right when this thing breaks. So keep me in mind, david.penzer at gmail.com. If you're not interested in real estate or if you're not in Florida, you could hit me up on Twitter at David Penzer, all one word, D-A-V-I-D-P-E-N-Z-E-R. And if you don't already, please uh, check out my podcast. It drops every Monday wherever podcasts are found. It's called Sitting Ringside with David Penzer. We're on year three. And um, each uh, week we have another guest on, uh, some legends, some some people behind the scenes, some people that are announcers or referees, uh, ladies and men, and uh, it just it's. Uh, I liken it to in the old days, back before cell phones, we would drive from town to town and just tell stories to entertain ourselves uh, at two o'clock in the morning, and that's what I like to do with the wrestlers is just tell stories to entertain the fans. So check it out if you don't already. If you like what you hear, uh, please subscribe. I appreciate it. It's a great podcast, David. We uh, always appreciate it and always enjoy listening each week. So thanks so much for doing it with us. We'll definitely check you out on your podcast, and I hope everyone enjoyed uh, hearing you on ours as well. So thanks so much. We'll definitely be in touch, my friend. All right, buddy. Thanks for inviting me. You bet. Thank you. Stay safe.